I would definitely consider myself a fan of horror, but I have pretty high standards. If a piece of media's purpose is to scare me, and it could not succeed at doing so, I'm going to be critical of it. Throughout the years, there have been plenty of phenomenal horror games that succeeded at sending shivers down your spine, and one of the gems in that list is Doki Doki Literature Club. Doki Doki Literature Club is a visual novel and psychological horror game made by Dan Salvato. It was released in mid-2017 and was very successful as it gathered a lot of attention because of its innovative concepts and deeply disturbing game design. The detail put into this work of art cannot be understated, and despite its massive success, it still feels underappreciated given how brilliant it is. So today, we'll be discussing this masterpiece and how Doki Doki Literature Club perfected psychological horror. Doki Doki Literature Club presents itself as an average dating sim game where you try to win over the girl of your choosing. That's because that's what the game is. But one of your four club members is fully sentient and aware that she is in a game. She knows she's made up of coding, and being aware that there's a real world out there that she can't even see is such a dreadful feeling that she manipulates the game from within in an attempt to have you, the player, alter herself. Monica will alter the character's traits to make them more unlikable to try to get you to spend less time with them and more time with her. She's even able to completely delete the other characters and alter the entire game's script. This is what leads to the game going from an adorable dating sim to a disturbing psychological horror. When Monica is erased from the game, the script stays the same as it was intended to be. You are introduced to the now three girls of the literature club, and everything feels normal. But that's only once Monica is gone. The game with Monica is a series of events and even restarts of the game where she does anything she can do to drive everyone else away from you. It starts with Sayori. Sayori has feelings for you, and Monica's way of preventing her from confessing to you is enhancing her depressive nature. Reworking her character to make her so depressed that no matter what you do to help her, she inevitably kills herself. No matter what path you take during your first playthrough, Sayori is guaranteed to kill herself, because that was Monica's best way of manipulating her feelings to prevent her from confessing her love to you. After Sayori's suicide, Monica restarts the entire game with Sayori's character deleted. And if you go to the game's files, you will see that Sayori's character is no longer there. The file is gone, and there is now a picture left behind instead. While we're on the subject of the character files, that is a very important part of this game and its creative concept. I've already said that Monica manipulates the way the game plays, but it's more than worth mentioning that you can literally see the files disappearing and being deleted. However, you should note the exception screen in the background. This is the exact screen that you would see when Rinpai crashes, but this one's obviously fake since Sayori's body is in front of it and the screen effects are still happening. Another giveaway is that it's telling you to check the traceback for more details. A traceback is essentially a log that's output to help you figure out why the game crashed. And if you'll look in the game directory, you'll see that there's no... Oh. This is the first of many creepy things that the game's going to do. This is a real traceback file that generates the moment the crash screen appears. But as you scroll through it, you'll find a message left for Monica talking about the error and deciding to just straight up delete Sayori from the game. The game isn't just designed to show you weird things happening. The game is designed to be able to access and alter your game files. Anyway, now that Sayori is no longer a part of the game, she is obviously unable to be a threat to Monica's plan but there's still Yuri and Natsuki. If you spend too much time with either of them, you'll be made to regret it. Natsuki gets it easier than Yuri. If you spend too much time with her, she'll become obsessed with you, and her text will be shown with blocky letters, and her eyes and mouth will also be covered by blocky glitches. Her neck will snap, and she'll jump scare the player, and the game will end. This is technically an ending, but the game will restart again as if nothing happened. Yuri's path is a much more disturbing one. She will become so obsessed with you, and it will drag on much longer. She'll get so flustered around you, and she'll say some of the most terrifying things you could be told by someone you see every day. It gets worse as the week progresses, and by the end of the week, she's insanely hostile towards the club members, until she confesses her love to you. Regardless of how you respond to her confession, she will pull out a knife and stab herself three times. Twice in the stomach, once in the chest. You're then forced to sit with her corpse over the entire weekend. 
This lasts an extremely long time, even when you speed it up. When Monica comes into the room after the weekend, she's surprised. Not really because Yuri is dead, but because you're still there. She says she didn't think the script was that broken, directly confessing for the first time that she is manipulating the game's code. We get another restart, and this time it's nothing like we've ever seen. We are now alone in a single room with Monica. There are no other characters, and you don't even get a look at the classroom that the entire game is taking place in. It's just you and her having a conversation forever. This is the end of the game unless you go to the game's files and delete her yourself. This will erase everything on screen. Monica is still able to speak, even if her name isn't attached to it. She admits that what she's done is terrible, and decides to reset the game to its original form. This works, however it grants Sayori Monica's abilities. She is now aware of everything that Monica was, but she isn't evil or anything, she is just now self-aware. But when Monica is in the background and seeing what's happening, she fully deletes everything. Out of rage, the game glitches like crazy, and the game ends. Monica sings us a song while playing the piano, as the credits roll. There are ways to get other endings, but I think it's important that we discuss what all of this really means. The way this game blends together with reality is nothing short of genius. The idea of actually altering your game files to create an immersive experience is some of the most innovative gameplay to ever come from the horror genre. The point of horror is to be scary, and the point of psychological horror, in particular, is to disturb and unsettle you by focusing on the mental and emotional responses to fear and discomfort. The concept of a game that has a character that is self-aware is not really new, but a game that looks so cute and normal that is then altering the files on your computer and manipulating the experience that it's meant to be with the intention of keeping you for a character's pleasure is so different and disturbing. The idea of a game like this being upfront about what it is, but at the same time lying to you inherently with its visuals and design, is brilliant. Now that it's been mentioned briefly, I would like to dive deeper into why this concept makes for the perfect horror experience. First of all, this is a game that looks innocent, but isn't. And that is not a new concept whatsoever, but it separates itself from others in its own unique way. Taking a look at Baldi's Basics, for example. Baldi's Basics does look like a shitty educational computer game from the 90s, but its satire is so exaggerated that there is simply no way of it fooling you. There are some terrible educational games with terrible graphics, but the dialogue designs mechanics and tone are too ironic to be convincing. The story! Everybody listen close. Oh no is, school is out, but your friend has a problem. He left all his notebooks in high school, but doesn't have time to go get them. Because if he do, he'll be late for eating practice. To help him out, you have to go back in the school and find all seven of his notebooks for him. It won't be easy though, Baldi loves challenging his students with fun trivia problems whenever he can. Each time you find a notebook, you'll have to answer some questions. Answer all three correctly and you'll earn a prize. But Doki Doki Literature Club isn't like that at all. Characters in dating sim games are usually this flat. This art style is very common in this genre. The writing resembles that of a dating sim very well. The only thing that makes it clear this isn't going to be as fun as it looks is the disclaimer at the beginning, but that is completely necessary to a game with this tone, and it also doesn't accurately depict exactly what it is you're going to be seeing throughout this game. The shock of this game is not at all cheap, and it works insanely well because the display of it is so perfectly designed to be convincing. That's another word to build upon. Cheap. Doki Doki doesn't pull any cheap tricks to scare you. There aren't jump scares without purpose, there aren't whispering sound effects in the background for no reason. Everything happens with a purpose and is done to scare you in a much more subtle and discomforting way. Doki Doki Literature Club does everything it can to make you think, this isn't right, what should I do? And at some point, you have to realize, 
You can't do much. Again, there is a good ending, but it is not easy to get and certainly won't be the result of your first playthrough. Sayori's depression and confession both make you question what to do next, but when the game shows you a suicide out of nowhere and then ends and glitches you into a new beginning, you're practically begging for an answer or an explanation. The best thing a psychological horror can do is make you feel like you're actually affected by the events in whatever form of media it is. And when you're presented with these characters and you're forced to see them suffer due to Monica manipulating them using your files, it makes you want to act. It makes you feel. It is perfect. If you've had enough of the scary talk, we're going to be steering away from that tone for a little. Something I really admire about this game is how much Dan Salvato did himself. He didn't only craft the game itself, but he wrote it all. Which is pretty remarkable because the writing of this game is one of its best qualities for various reasons. The actual writing, being the dialogue of your character and others, was a huge part of making DDLC an immersive experience as well as keeping up the disguise of being a regular dating sim. The way this game describes every single scenario, except for the moments of horror, is exactly what you would expect from a dating sim. The characters stutter and giggle when they talk to you, every event is as cheesy as it gets, and our protagonist is a major fucking virgin. The characters are also very flat, once again, only until the horror elements come in. Yuri is shy, Natsuki is a big angry baby, Monika is a leader, and Sayori is goofy. It's pretty simple, much like the characters in every dating sim ever. They are pretty much described using one word. But as I said, their characters definitely change up when Monika takes over more. Uh, this is going to get spooky again, sorry. Yuri is the character that I would like to talk about the most. I will be talking about everyone, but Yuri is the most interesting to me. Her dialogue has to be the most bone-chilling, even if Monica's is focused more towards you. Experiencing her obsession grow over time is one of the most disturbing parts of this entire game. The way she expresses so much hate for the club members, and the way she describes her love for you, is some of the most unsettling dialogue in any game. Natsuki and Sayori aren't as horrifying, but they are definitely interesting. Sayori's experience with depression feels very genuine, and I think the dialogue between you and Sayori is very realistic. And Natsuki, much like Yuri, gets a lot more aggressive with time. Their argument in the first playthrough isn't nearly as serious, but once you return to this point after Sayori's deletion, it's a lot darker. Natsuki's path just isn't as interesting as Yuri's, so I don't really have as much to say about it. And it only makes sense that I talk about Monica's dialogue as well, specifically at the end of the game, when it's just you and her alone in a room. There's nothing super fantastic about it, but considering that it's a one-sided conversation with a fictional character, it's pretty convincing and makes these final moments much creepier. The writing, out of context, isn't anything super brilliant, but the way the text changes the experience is very, very noteworthy. It's clear that the developer of Doki Doki wanted to make sure every detail was special, and I think it's only fair to acknowledge everything that made this game a wonderful experience. Dan Salvato didn't only create the game and write all the text, he was also responsible for the soundtrack. DDLC has one of my favorite soundtracks of any video game. There's a fantastic combination of various tones that enhance the experience of every event. The cute moments from the beginning are made even more fun by the cheery music. The shocking and horrific imagery is enhanced with the disturbing music. And there's also this amazing song for the credits that features a vocal performance from Jillian Ashcraft. Every feeling that you're made to feel throughout Doki Doki is made even more intense by the great OST. It's only fair that we take the time to discuss the artwork as well. The character art was done by an artist who goes by Satchley, forgive me if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, and the background art was done by Valinquent. Again, forgive me if these aren't pronounced how they're meant to be. I absolutely adore the art in this game. The character designs, despite not being the most innovative or unique, are all really adorable and work off of each other just as well as their actual personalities. All of the backgrounds and settings are gorgeous and make every moment pleasant to look at despite the lack of movement or changes. The cute moments are all cute, the casual moments all feel natural, and the scary moments are certainly disturbing and definitely stand out. The image of Yuri on the floor and the image of Sayori hanging herself are genuinely frightening. The darker colors set the tone, and the expressions on both their faces feel so real despite being drawings. 
It makes you feel truly sad despite it being a game. Not only is the moment just shocking, but their eyes actually look lifeless. Yuri doesn't even look like she's in pain despite presumably still being alive, even if the text is meaningless. She just looks helpless and lost as she looks up at you. The poems are also worth discussing, as they add so much to the depth of the character's story and concept. As it's very frequently discussed, every member of the literature club has a different style of writing. Much like it would be if this was a real club, it's legitimately nice to read these poems with such different tones and styles. It's also great to see how different people interpret the poems in different ways. Furthermore, it's amazing how differently you interpret them once the game is over. Since the primary subject of this video is how this game succeeds as a psychological horror, I want to mention how everything I'm covering contributes to that success. Once again, the difference between horror and psychological horror is that the media focuses on your mental, emotional, and psychological state of mind and attempts to tap into that to make you as scared, disturbed, and unsettled as possible. So making the game more realistic will most definitely make doing so much easier. The fact that the actions and dialogue of each character fits their personality, feelings, and the scenario so well makes the overall experience feel more real. And since it feels more real, the shocking moments hit even harder. I admire, respect, and love how much thought went into this game. Each and every element is crafted in a way that makes Doki Doki Literature Club an absolute masterpiece. I don't think there's a genre in gaming that's seen more growth in recent years than horror. With Five Nights at Freddy's going from being an indie series made by one person to having a game on display at the 2021 PlayStation Showcase, and games like Phasmophobia breaking down some crazy barriers in their field, gaming and horror is reaching new highs on a yearly basis. And Doki Doki Literature Club is far from an exception. Dan Silvato managed to perfect so many elements of horror in just one experience, and he did it in such an innovative way. This game pulled no punches, and it also didn't shove random shock value down your throat. Every aspect of DDLC is designed to fool you and then scare the life out of you, and it succeeded so much more than most horror media in general. From Monica manipulating your game files, to the grotesque imagery, to the music, to the writing, Doki Doki Literature Club managed to perfect psychological horror.